Okay, hello, I'll do the best I can. <clears throat> so, um, So there's three things I want to talk to you about today. Whatever time is left after all that. It's interesting, we're talking about judgment in both 106 and 100 C today, and yet they mean something completely different. <laughs> How knowledge can be extended. That is, one way is by reason, another way is by instruction, and possibly another way is by faith. And then finally, although I'm feeling pessimistic about getting to this, about the knowledge of existence which included under this is proof, Locke's proof of the existence of God. Which is interesting and weird, but whether I'll get to it, I don't know. Just see if this is working now. No. All right. Oops, that's right. Okay, so as I emphasized before, uh, knowledge, as Locke uses the term, involves certainty. And moreover, certainty means, quote unquote, perceiving that a proposition must be true. So, uh, if you have that kind of certainty, you can't be wrong because you've perceived that it must be true, right? That is by perceiving the agreement or disagreement of the ideas. Um, so that is, it's not enough, for example, like to have no reason to doubt something. That's something you might call certainty, but that's not going to be enough for what Locke calls knowledge. Um, so not surprisingly, we don't have very much knowledge. Um, right, and it talked a little bit last time about like how kind of the only kind of substance we have knowledge of is body. <laughs> um, and I mean, so like that restricted knowledge is very, that limited knowledge we have is really important, right? That as I, I was explaining that I think according to Locke, it includes mathematics <coughs> and fundamental physics and morality right so like those are pretty important but as soon as you get outside of that we don't have any knowledge so in addition to the faculty or power of knowledge we have um this other faculty which Locke calls judgment so um What Locke means by judgment, as I was just saying, is it's like it's quite different than, for example, what Kant means by judgment. Um, and it's really an unusual use of the term judgment. I'm not sure where it comes from. It, perhaps Locke actually just invented it based on how we ordinarily use the word judgment in English, right? Like in my judgment, you know, something like that. I'm not sure. But in any case, so Locke uses it for um, our ability to put ideas together or separate them from each other without perceiving that they must go together or um, <clears throat> must be uh, separated from each other.
So, um, right, that is, we don't either directly or immediately perceive an agreement or disagreement, that would be intuitive knowledge, nor do we immediately, by means of putting other ideas in between, perceive agreement and disagreement. That would be demonstrative knowledge. Rather, we just uh, affirm that the ideas go together. So, uh, and the reason I wrote opinion in parentheses on the board um, is that therefore what law calls judgment is basically what's traditionally called opinion. And in fact, sometimes Locke does call it opinion. <laughs> um, so, uh, so the distinction between right judgments and knowledge, right? Locke says, when we put the ideas together, and they really do go together, we call that right judgment. The distinction between right judgment and knowledge is basically the old platonic distinction between true opinion and knowledge. Um, knowledge and true belief, right? True belief is uh, um, mere belief or opinion can be just as true as knowledge, but uh, there's no certainty to it. It's not tied down um, as Plato puts it. Um, <clears throat> Keep hoping my usual software will somehow get better and come back. So far, that's not happening. And yet it worked fine throughout the previous class. All right, I have to just stop thinking about that. So, as we, I mean, saying that we put the ideas together without perceiving agreement or disagreement makes it sound like it's just arbitrary. And I think um, this faculty of judgment includes the power of doing that just arbitrarily. <clears throat> right, just like affirming something for no reason at all, but that's not what you should do, right? So we already know that Locke says that reason has a role both in knowledge and in forming opinion. Oh, yeah, Josephine said, so like Giordano Bruno had an opinion slash judgment that there are many solar systems, while well, today we have knowledge that they are. Yeah, although I think Locke would say that in that case, too, all we have is very high probability. I mean, <clears throat> I don't know. Actually, it's an interesting question. Has someone seen that there are... Like what? Are, what exactly? It doesn't ri arise rise above the level of sensible knowledge for sure, right? Like we don't know that there are other solar systems better than I know that there's a pen here. Um, we don't have intuitive or demonstrative knowledge. But whether we even have that or whether it's more like my knowledge that there are a lot of people in China, which Locke says is not really knowledge, it's just very high probability. Um, 
I'm not sure where to draw the line. Um, but anyway, yeah, that's the basic general idea. You you can, in principle, there's things where you can have a right judgment and then you can change it to knowledge by finding the intermediate ideas and proving it. But there's also things where knowledge in many things, most things where knowledge is just not available. So right judgment is the best you can do. And again, Locke thinks that reason, although he doesn't go into detail explaining what these rules are, that reason provides rules for probability as well as for knowledge. So reason also tells us how we should form judgments of probability, where we're not certain that they're true, but we affirm them. Um, um, we find them believable. We find them highly believable. And we're right to. It's rational to. Even though we could be wrong. Uh, <clears throat> um, okay, so that's that's the distinction between judgment and knowledge. I think um, um Although most of what we ordinarily think of as knowledge now is going to fall under judgment, according to Locke, um, he's nevertheless much more interested in knowledge than he is in judgment. Why is that? Um, I guess because he thinks it's knowledge that's socially most socially useful. And if that sounds strange... Remember, again, that he thinks that morality can, in principle, be as demonstrative as uh, mathematics. Right? So the really important things for us to know, uh, we can know. We can prove them, according to Locke. Um, so he brings in judgment, shows how absolutely essential it is to life, but doesn't say a lot more about it. Um, okay, so that was number one on my list. Um, are there questions about that? Okay. Can you show the board again? Oh, perfect. yes. Oh, you just you just wanted to see what was there. Yeah. I erased the rest of the list, but I'm going to write the next <laughs> How knowledge can be extended. And it said A, reason, B, instruction. and C, faith, question mark. All right, so um, so st strictly speaking, um, the improvement or extension by knowledge of reason, of, you know, applies only to demonstrative knowledge. Right. That is, we extend our knowledge by finding intermediate ideas. Um, and remember, I gave an example of that last time with the proof that the, the interior angles of a triangle add to 180 degrees, where I said um, that... Uh, you know, the idea on one end is the idea of these three angles. And the idea on the other end is the idea of these two angles. And the intermediate ideas Are the ideas of these three angles, right? And you can 
right, where this this is this line is perpendicular to the base of the triangle. And so you you know, since this one has to equal this one, and this one has to equal this one, and this one is just the same as this one, these three have to be equal to these three. But on the other hand, since this whole arc is the same as this whole arc, these three have to be equal to this two, these two, and that's the proof. Um, Locke seems to assume throughout the discussion that we already have two ideas that we want to connect. Right? Like we know what we're trying to prove. And we're just looking for the right intermediate ideas to do it. Right? So he talks about these faculties of sagacity and elation which um, which are the ability to find the intermediate ideas and put them in the right order. Um, he doesn't ask, how do we come up with a conjecture in the first place? Oh, Josephine says, it strikes me that for Locke, judgment is about presuming connections you are not certain of. While presuming connections wrongly is madness. Well, I think, I mean, madness, that is the association of ideas, um, is worse than wrong opinion. Right? So wrong opinion means I take two ideas that I know are different and I put them together for no good reason. Well, I mean, actually, that is, that's not... I could still be right. <laughs> I could guess right, right? But that I mean, wrongly formed opinion, let's say, groundless opinion. So I mean, that's a bad thing to do, obviously. But um, you can show me the error of my ways by pointing out that the two ideas don't agree with each other. Whereas in the case of madness, Locke says the ideas are so connected that I can't think of one without the other anymore. Um, so it's not really the faculty of judgment that's at work there. Right? I, I, like, I don't take the two ideas separately and then connect them by an act of, I guess, of my will. Um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm unable to separate them. Um, and therefore, Locke says, you can argue to you blue in the face and it won't do any good, right? Because every proof that you show me, when you show me that it's A and not B, I have A and B so connected that as soon as you say A, B comes in and automatically. So I can't see what you're trying to show even. Um, okay. Um, so that's a good question. Um, all right, anyway, back to Locke on demonstration. Um, this, another remark about Locke on demonstration that I think um, I have probably said before, but it bears repeating, which is that um, Locke doesn't recognize any other use of demonstration other than reaching certainty about the agreement or disagreement of two ideas that we didn't previously perceive agreement or disagreement between. Um, uh, <clears throat> so he says that every demonstration, you know, at the beginning of every demonstration, the conclusion is in doubt. Every demonstration must start with doubt, right? So I have these two ideas and I say, do they agree with each other or don't they agree with each other? And then I use my sagacity to try to find something to go in between. And when I find it, now the doubt is replaced by certainty and I'm done. So um, if I were to look for a new demonstration of the same fact, it would be a waste of time, for example. Unless, I mean, I guess it's 
possible that a shorter demonstration would be preferable. I don't think he says that anywhere. Um, if you could find a shorter one, that would be easier to remember or something. But for the most part, once you've proved it, you have the certainty that you lacked and you're done. This is also why there's no point in proving things that are self-evidently true. Um, so, uh, because that means you already perceive the agreement or disagreement, and there's no reason to put other ideas in between. So, uh, I mean, and I'm emphasizing this because, in, in fact, in mathematics, there are many other uses for demonstration. I'm, I mean, I'm not even sure if the main use is for mathematicians to convince themselves that things are true that they weren't sure about. Um, I mean, I guess they do that, except a lot of times they're pretty sure before they find the proof. I guess Locke would call that high probability, although he might have a hard time understanding it, explaining where it comes from in the case of mathematics, and for that matter, so do I. But um, but it's true, mathematicians, right? There's conjectures that are around for decades or centuries even, and everyone's pretty sure they're true, but they just haven't found the proof yet. Um, but in any case, uh, be that as it may, it's certainly true that once you find a proof or when you have something that's totally obvious, like two plus one equals three or whatever, mathematicians are still interested in proofs. Right, because proofs show something about the relationship between different propositions. So you learn what depends on what and stuff like that. And Locke has no space for that in the way he understands what a demonstration is. Um, I guess there's only one other thing to say about extending knowledge through reason, which is that um, Although strictly speaking, reason, according to Locke, means it's the faculty of um, proving. Oh, now you can't see what I'm pointing at. This is really bad. I don't know why this happens. Strictly speaking, reason means um, it, reason is the faculty of proving. So it's the faculty of demonstrative knowledge, but sometimes he uses reason in a somewhat broader sense where you could say that, I mean, so like, I should never raise this. Of course, like every step in the demonstration has to be intuitive. So in fact, you, we actually extend our knowledge not only by demonstration, but also by intuition. I mean, that might seem weird, like if it's immediately evident from comparing the two ideas that they agree. And I mean, I think at least in this step, Locke thinks that's the case. I don't know, there might have to be more steps in here. But in this step, I think Locke thinks this is intuitive. It's intuitively certain that this way of dividing the whole semicircle has the same total degree as this way of dividing the whole semicircle. Right? It's 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 an instance of that maxim that the whole is equal to the sum of its parts. But Locke thinks the instances are more useful than the maxim. So um, in any case, you, like, you might think it's strange to say that we can extend our knowledge by intuition because it's, if it's self-evidently, the ideas self-evidently agree with each other, then how are we learning something new? But, um, uh, you know, remember, uh, what Locke said about supposed innate principles, like it is impossible for this both the same thing both to be and not to be. He said that sure enough, as soon as you have all the ideas that go into that proposition and you compare them with each other, you immediately see that, that they agree. 
but you have to get the ideas and compare them to each other. <laughs> So you do extend your knowledge, right? And that's why you weren't born knowing that. You had to, you you had to first get there those ideas, but that's still not enough because you had to put them together in the right way and compare them. And once you do that, you would see, you would perceive intuitively that a certain thing is true. And now you know something that you didn't know before. So intuition is also uh if if that's distinct from reason is also a way of extending our knowledge um now um i think having explained how in, in how extension of knowledge by reason works extension extension of knowledge by instruction is um supposed to be basically exactly the same thing so let me read um this is book four chapter 17 section four on page 593 Oh, is it on page 593? Oh, no, 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 that's something completely different. Sorry. <laughs> Book four, chapter eight, section three on page 540. Instruction lies in something very different. Oops, why is that? Nothing's working right today. Instruction lies in very different something very different, right? He's just finished saying why trifling propositions don't convey knowledge. Instruction lies in something very different, and he that would enlarge his own or another's mind to truths he does not yet know must find out intermediate ideas and then lay them in such order one by another that the understanding may see the agreement or disagreement of those in question. Right, so the way I find out something for myself um, is the same as the way I instruct someone else in it. Namely, I find it out for myself by finding those intermediate ideas and putting them in the right order. And I instruct someone else by um, having the ideas in the right order, expressing them by language, which consists of words in the right order. <laughs> they change it back into ideas in the right order. And now I've they can... Uh, gain the same certainty that I have. Um, and uh, I think the the same thing um, applies in the case of instruction as a play, kind of applies in the case of reason. I can teach you an intuitive truth. Right? I can say, white is not black and if you never bothered to compare the idea of white and the idea of black before <laughs> then by saying white is not black i cause you to put the i compare the idea of white to the idea of black with respect to the agreement and disagreement in identity and diversity and you see that sure enough, they're diverse. And now you know that white is not black. So I, I taught it to you, even though you didn't know it before. Um, presumably the same thing also works in matters of probability. 
right? My reason tells me how to how to um, construct a probable inference from one idea to another, and then I lay it out for you, and you, and again through the same process, you get the same probability that I have. Um, okay, so so far this is pretty straightforward. The interesting part comes when we talk about this. Um, so because faith is a way of gaining knowledge or at least probability by something that's kind of like instruction. So here's the definition of faith. This is book four, chapter 18, section two on page 608. I should turn this off. No, that's not better. Faith, on the other side, that is, as opposed to reason, is the assent to any proposition not thus made out by the deductions of reason, but upon the credit of the proposer as coming from God in some extraordinary way of communication. So it's on the credit, um, I think, by using this word credit here, he's slipping in a little etymology, <laughs> right? That like, uh, uh, to have faith, credere, means to give someone credit. <laughs> um, that is not an etymology of the English word faith, but an etymology of the Latin word. <laughs> um, so, uh, so um, this definition of faith is sent to a proposition not made out by deductions, right? So I haven't shown you intermediate ideas between the two sides. Um, where, how then are you supposed to get knowledge or at least probability from this? Um, well, so in the specific case he's talking about, it's because I tell you that God told me and, um, uh, God is not a deceiver and can't be wrong. So if God told me, it must be true. Um, but I think, like, uh, to see what he's saying about this, you have to realize that that's really just, I mean, this definition of faith in this context is really just a special case of a general definition of faith, meaning giving credit or trusting right like i mean suppose i didn't tell you that god told me but i just say i know <laughs> well if you believe me right you know if you trust me then that will give you a reason to put the two ideas together even though you haven't seen the intermediates So the part about it coming from God is just a special case. It's supposed to be a special case because um, the at least alleged ultimate source of it is absolutely trustworthy. Uh, I mean, you need to supply a proof that God is not a deceiver. If I get to talking to you in the... 
in detail about um, Locke's proof of the existence of God, I think we'll see it's somewhat questionable whether he's succeeded in proving that God is not a deceiver. Um, when Descartes proves that, his argument is very short. He says all deception is due to either to weakness or to malice. Um, so, I mean, Locke's proof should, certainly shows that there's no weakness in God, but it's not clear where he shows that there's no malice. Okay, anyway, leaving that aside, um, it's supposed to be a special case because God is absolutely trustworthy. So this would be a specially good kind of learning things, taking things on faith, on credit. Um, however, when you look farther into Locke's analysis of how this works, it turns out that um, faith defined that way is not really a separate source of knowledge at all. It's really nothing more than our usual faculties of reason and judgment. So I think that's especially the case in, in especially clear in the case of what Locke calls traditional revelation. So traditional revelation um, means that um, there's one person here. This is the prophet. God tells the prophet something. It might be, as Locke says, it, it might be something that we could have known through reason, right? It might be something like the angles of the triangle add up to two right angles. Um, but of course, it's more useful if it's something we couldn't have known through reason. Like one time there was this big flood <laughs> or something like that. Okay, so God tells the prophet that, and then, God, and then the prophet tells me that God said that. And um, I'm supposed to believe it because, and so there's actually two steps here, right? I have to believe the prophet. <laughs> um, right, I mean, uh, if some random person comes up to me and says, God told me that, you know, uh, um, you should put all your money in the stock market or something like that, um, I'm going to say, wait, why should I think that God, why should I believe that God told you that? Um, and I mean, of course, it's going to be worse in the more usual case where right where there's like someone told me that someone told them that someone told them that someone told them, blah, 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 that the prophet told them that God told them. Um, so, uh, you know, Locke says, uh, um, number one, uh, obviously what we, well, what should I call number one? <laughs> Actually, I should say, um,
Yeah, no, I will go in that order. <laughs> you don't even know what I'm talking about. All right. So number one, um, the supposed knowledge we get through this revelation can never be as certain as what we would get through our own reason. Right, so uh, like book four, chapter 18, section four, page 609, I think this is the same page I was just on. Um, for the knowledge we have that this revelation came at first from God can never be so sure as the knowledge we have from the clear and distinct perception of the agreement or disagreement of our own ideas. Right? It's never going to be as good as using our own reason. Because even though it's true that God is absolutely trustworthy, um, so uh, no, that made it worse. Oh, there we go. Huh. Even though it's true that God is absolutely trustworthy. Um, so if we really knew that God was telling us something, that would be, uh, that would be enough to establish perfect certainty, at least in the case of traditional revelation, uh, we are never completely sure that God is telling us something. Um, um. And as he says, going on, right, he says, like, if someone tells you that you should believe something because it's in this book that Moses wrote and God told him what to write in the book, he says, well, number one, you don't have the same assurance you would have if you saw Moses write the book. Now all he knows someone told you Moses wrote the book. But even if you saw Moses write the book, how how sure could you be that what he wrote in it was God what God told him to write in the book? Locke seems to think that you might be pretty sure, actually. Um, but nevertheless, you can't be as sure as you can be that. Um, this is a bad example because it turns out not to be true, but that the three angles of a triangle must add up to two right angles. Um, so that's traditional revelation. But what about the case of what Locke calls original revelation? Right, so original revelation is where I'm the prophet. And God tells me directly. I didn't hear it from someone else. So now you might say, well, now you can be certain, right? Because if God told you, it must be true. Well, going back to the same place that was before, but I lost the page. Um almost the same place I was before. Book 4, Chapter 18, Section 5, on page There, too, our assurance can be no greater than our knowledge is that it is a revelation from God. Right? Are you sure God is the one who's telling you? You know, you see a, like, burning bush and a voice comes out of it and says, like, Moses, I have heard the, you know, whatever, the affliction of my people in Egypt and... 
Are you sure that's God? Maybe it's uh, a demon, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, um, so even in that case, uh, it, you could never be as certain as you would be of the results of your own reason. Um, and in both cases, now I've lost the page again, but I have to go back to this is on page 611. So it's section six of that same chapter, 18. Yeah, here we go. Sorry. The believing, so it starts without such a revelation. So he's talking about, what he's talking about here is someone who says, if you say, oops, If 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 you say, well, how am I supposed to be certain that what's in this book came from God? And the person says, well, that's a matter of faith. Locke says that can only mean that there was another prophet who came along and said that that book was what's in that book was written by God, right? So, uh, like, uh, um. It doesn't quite say this, but like, yeah. you can't keep doing that. That would be infinite regress, <laughs> right? Um, so, uh, so eventually, you have to arrive at a book where uh, there isn't another revelation saying that that book is a revelation. Um, so, and that's the context here. So, without such a revelation, the believing or not believing that proposition or book to be of a divine authority can never be a matter of faith, but matter of reason. Right? So what he's saying is, like, uh, whether it's original revelation or traditional revelation, um, there's, you know, there's one step, which is, if God says it, it must be true. Call, you could call that part faith. But um, there's always another step, which is, and I know God said it because... And that part is never faith, that's reason. Right, so that's why I said that really faith is not a separate, according to Locke, is not a separate way of extending our knowledge. It always comes down to weighing probabilities or you might think perhaps in some case having a demonstration, but when would that be? Certainly, in case of traditional revelation, it's always going to be probabilities. How likely is it that this person is 
um, telling me the truth when they say that God told them so and so. So it's really is so we really have is not so much faith and reason, but reason in general and reason in this special case. And this special case is not a case of the highest certainty, right? It's a case of probability, perhaps of high probability, but it's always going to be less than the certainty that we get from reason directly. Um, so where is this heading? Well, one place it's heading, um, as usual, this is back in section five on page 610. We can never receive for a truth anything that is directly contrary to our clear and distinct knowledge. For example, the ideas of one body and one place do so clearly agree, and the mind has so evident perception of their agreement, that we can never assent to a proposition that affirms the same body to be in two distant places at once, however it should pretend to the authority of divine revelation, right? So as usual, the immediate moral is anti-Catholic. Right? He's saying that uh, um, even though, by the way, this doctrine that reason, uh, that faith never conflicts with reason is a traditional Catholic doctrine as well. Uh, it's just a, but never mind that. But so, right, what he's saying is like, if someone comes and tells you that such and such happens in the Eucharist and it's clearly absurd, then there's no use for their appealing to faith because faith can never attain the same certainty as reason. Zoe said, so both instruction and faith are kinds of reason. Um, well, instruction, I mean, I get, yeah, I guess I would put, I'm not sure if I'd say they're kinds of reason, but instruction and faith both to the extent that they extend our, can extend our knowledge, work by appealing to our reason. Right, so inst instruction works by um, getting you to see the steps yourself and therefore using your own reason to reach the conclusion. Um, it's still really useful, right? Because it's hard to find those intermediate ideas. So uh, it can be really useful if someone else already found them out, like Euclid, <laughs> that uh, you don't have to go to the trouble. Um, but nevertheless, the way it works in the end is by appealing to your reason. And the same thing is true of faith. Um, but the difference is that faith appeals to your reason um, insofar as reason helps you establish probability, not certainty. Right. So I was saying is like one way this is heading is, is saying, well, the Catholics tell you to believe this absurd thing and they say it's a matter of faith. You say, well, I'm sorry, it's absurd. So it can't be a matter of faith. Um, but another place it's heading that he doesn't say straight out, but that could be as much perhaps more directed at Protestants, especially in England in this period than Catholics. Um, suppose someone comes and says, uh, God told me that you should kill all those innocent people and take all their stuff. So um, Locke thinks morality can be as demonstrative as mathematics. So you can have a demonstration that you shouldn't kill innocent people and take all their stuff. 
no matter how much uh, someone appeals to faith, quotes supposed divine revelation, whatever, you're always going to say, well, maybe it's not really from God. Maybe you don't interpret it right, but it can't mean that, <laughs> right? Or, I mean, that is, it, if it does come from God, it can't mean that. Because my reason, which is a higher level of certainty, is uh, like just rules that out. Just as much as if they've said, you know, well, look, it says in this book that pi equals three. And it's divine. I say, well, pi just doesn't equal three. <laughs> uh, so there's no use trying to prove it to me by saying that God told you or whatever. Um um so that's what Locke is doing with this definitely um Hume uh now we're not going to read this Hume's on miracles although it would be nice to read some here but oh well it's too much but um Hume looks at the same situation so it's a somewhat different question, but it's a very closely related question. Uh, maybe it's not even really that different. Hume says, okay, so uh, suppose you see a burning bush and it's not consumed. Well, Hume agrees that under certain circumstances, and this is a violation of the laws of nature, right? So Hume defines a miracle as a violation of the laws of nature. Uh, that's like really different, for example, from the way Spinoza defines a miracle. But anyway, that's how Hume defines a miracle, as a violation of the laws of nature. So Hume says, yeah, I agree. There's something you could see that would cause you to believe that the laws of nature are violated. Um, that, by the way, is different from, draw another contrast, it's different from Kant. If you're in 106, you probably can kind of see by now why Kant would say that we could never experience a miracle in that sense. Um, but Hume says, yeah, we can experience that. We can experience something that causes me to say the laws of nature are violated. But now, Suppose I'm not the one I saw it. I'm hearing it from this other person. So now he says, well, it's a matter of probability. I have to weigh the probabilities on each side. And the probabilities I have to weigh on each side are, number one, the probability that the laws of nature were violated versus, number two, the probability that the person who's telling me is either lying or mistaken right, mistaken perhaps because they were caught up in enthusiasm or whatever. And Hume says, well, there's really no comparison here, right? Like nothing could be less probable than a violation of the laws of nature. Whereas people lying and getting confused and mistaken when it comes to religion is like the most normal thing that happens all the time. It's highly probable. <laughs> Right. So Hume concludes that uh, there can never be a credible, credible report of a miracle, although there could be an experience you would go through that would cause you to believe that there was a miracle. You never could receive a credible report of it from someone else. It's always going to be more likely. The, explan the other explanations are always going to be more likely than the explanation that there was a miracle. Um, um, and the reason I say it's not really that different is because in a sense, like, well, I mean, just think about what does it mean that God tells the prophet something? In in this way of looking at it, I mean, like the way Maimonides and Al-Farabi look at it, when you say God tells the prophet something, you mean that like the prophet perceives a philosophical truth with their intellect. <laughs> That's what it means that God tells the prophet something. So, I mean, uh, um, but this way of understanding what it means that God tells the prophet something, 
right? And so then, like, on their way of looking at it, there could be no conflict between original revelation and reason, because original revelation is reason. <laughs> That's how God reveals himself to prophets, by their reason. Okay, but on this way of looking at things, what does it mean that God told the prophet something? Well, it means, for example, that they saw a miraculous burning bush and they heard a miraculous voice coming out of it. That's why they believed that it was divine revelation, and you're never going to believe that. So uh, Hume is using this to... Um, Um, attack the possibility of the relevance of traditional revelation in general. I guess uh, the question with respect to Locke is, uh, does he not notice that implication? Does he notice it and have an answer to it that we don't know? Or does he notice it and secretly agree with it but not say it? <laughs> um, and I guess all those options are possible. <laughs> um, okay. I'm actually not doing too bad as far as time. Maybe this bad camera thing actually helps somehow. Can't see how. All right, that's because that's all I wanted to say about faith. Other questions about that before I go on to knowledge of existence? Okay. Um, all right, so knowledge of existence. So remember, I think I... I think I talked about this very briefly last time, maybe. It's not clear exactly what Locke means by knowledge of existence. It's supposed to be the fourth mode of agreement, of agreement and disagreement of ideas. But at first, it looked like uh, one of the terms wasn't an idea at all. Right? It looked like... Um, in the case of the fourth mode, we were talking about the agreement between the idea and the object. This is the mind. This is the perception of the idea. The object causes the perception. Right. So we were talking about this agreement. Um, and, but of course, that would screw up the whole scheme because the mind is supposed to only be conversant about its own ideas, and else knowledge is supposed to be conversant about ideas, and it's supposed to be about agreement and disagreement of ideas, and here's something that's not an idea. Um, Yeah, I feel like I actually said quite a bit of this before. But maybe I think I was rushed when I talked about it before. So let me see. Um, Here's the um, place I may have referred to, but I don't think I read. Chapter 2, 
I mean, book two, chapter seven, section seven. Um, On page 131. Existence and unity are two other ideas that are suggested to the understanding by every object without and every idea within. When ideas are in our minds, we consider them as being actually there, as well as we consider things to be actually without us which is that they exist or have existence. And whatever we can consider, oh no, sorry, that's going on to unity. Right, so he's saying that whenever we have an idea, it brings with it the idea of existence So here's the idea of existence. And then he says, um, that is, we know both that the idea e exists and that its object is now without us. Now, I mean, presumably this doesn't mean that everything we have an idea of exists and necessarily exists, right? Because we perceive an agreement between it, the idea of that thing, like the idea of a unicorn and the idea of existence. Um, Therefore, a unicorn exists. It, Locke presumably doesn't mean that. I mean, that is sort of what Spinoza takes this to mean. Um, and uh, um, as I think I mentioned before, Locke was in Amsterdam in 1683. Spinoza died in 1677, so they weren't in Amsterdam at the same time. But uh, you know, there's always speculation that he that Locke talked to Spinozists when he was there. Um, however, uh, I mean, th th clearly that's not what Locke means by this. Um, and in any case, even Spinoza will add. And I guess I should say for people who weren't in 100B, and I'm telling you these bizarre things that Spinoza um, believed. Yeah, it's really weird, but <laughs> but but Spinoza thinks that uh, um, everything possible exists um, uh, because uh, the divine essence consists in infinite power, which means it produces everything possible. So, but even Spinoza will is going to add that that it's only true that everything possible exists, um, as he puts it, subspecie aeternitatis, right under the aspect of eternity, um, from an eternal point of view, whereas sub the way I pronounce things in Latin is so inconsistent. Subspecie, subspecie, <laughs> temporis, under the aspect of time, uh, um, all we can conclude is that the object of uh, a our clear, adequate idea must exist at some time or other, but not necessarily now. Um, 
Right. So now you understand it like why it's not quite as weird as it sounds to say that everything possible exists. It, from our point of view, it means everything possible exists at some time, but not necessarily now. Um, so, um, and that actually, I think, does, without claiming that Locke took this from Spinoza, I mean, there's, yeah, no, there's, 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 there isn't sufficient similarity here to, to base that on. It's only, but, But it is interesting that it's that that in some abstract level they're saying the same thing. Um, that like that gives some clue as to what kind of agreement this is. This is agreement of ideas at a time. At what time? Well, like so. When we say we know the idea exists. Because it agrees with existence, we know we what we know is that the idea exists now, <laughs> right? When we perceive the agreement of this idea with the idea of existence, we know that this idea now exists. Um, it doesn't tell us that it will exist or that it used to exist. Um, but what about the object? And I think that. Um, I think the answer is that as long as it's just this agreement with existence, this just tells us that the object exists at some time, right? So it is similar to Spinoza. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm pointing to the board and you can't see it. Someone should speak up when I do that. Right. What I, so what I was saying before is when we perceive the, the agreement of this idea with existence, what we know is that this idea exists now. So unlike other forms of agreement and disagreement of ideas, this one is tied to a time. Um, right. I mean, this is connected to the other stuff, as you remember, where Locke says that um, 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 time and space are principles of, in, of individuation that um, uh, if something actually exists, it has to exist at one place at one time. Um, so that is the idea of existence brings along with it the idea of it, it, it always means existence at a specific time. Um, so I think that all we get from this agreement of ideas, again, is that the object exists at some time. So it's like possible that it exists now, but um focus the technology is failing me today So then the question of whether, of when it exists, well, if this is a simple idea, then, um, the quality that is the ability to cause me to perceive this idea must have existed, must exist either now or in the past. If it exists now, this is an instance of perception. If it existed in the past, this is an instance of memory. This is the quality. <laughs>
And the question is, is it perception or is it memory? Right? So when Locke goes on to discuss whether um, Six. All right. Um, when Locke uh, goes on to dis to discuss the question of uh, can we be sure of the evidence of our senses, he um, discusses it in terms of distinguishing between perception and memory. Right, like. Can I tell the difference between the perception of the sun when it's day and the memory of the sun when it's night? That's that's because, like, uh, at least the simple ideas that make up my idea of the sun, I'm either perceiving now or I'm remembering them because the mind can't make its own simple ideas. That's, you know, that statement, the mind can't make its own simple ideas, is Locke's empiricism. That's what it all comes down to, right? So but another way of putting that is every simple idea is either the object of perception or the object of memory, right? It's either caused by the object or it was caused by a previous object. Right, and this is why he says, this is book four, chapter 11, section 11 on page 562. As when our senses As when our senses are actually employed about any object, we do know that it does exist. So by our memory, we may be assured that heretofore things that affected our senses have existed. Right, so again, as I said before, memory is not, um, according to Locke, um, it's not kind of having a current image and inferring that um, something must have existed. It's, it's somehow more direct than that. It's as direct as perception um, because you, um, you perceive the agreement there is between your idea and existence. So you know the object exists. The only thing you don't know is, does it exist now or did it exist then? If you can rule out that it exists now, then you know that it must have existed in the past. 
So it's as good as perception, only it refers to the past rather than the present. How we can be so sure about all this, like in particular, how can we be so sure that the mind can't make its own simple ideas is another question. But at least like if you put that in as an axiom, so to speak, that I think the rest of it makes sense. Um, right. So in the case of sensible things, this is how we can know that they now exist or that they once existed, at least insofar as we just refer to them, denominate them by simple ideas. Right. So they may not know that a snowball exists, but we know that a white thing exists because the perception uh, of white has to come from the power to cause me to perceive the idea of white. Um, having said that, I feel like there's something missing because Locke says that sensible knowledge is less certain, although it's still certain. So I don't know what that even means, but it's less certain than intuitive or demonstrative knowledge. Um, whereas the way I've been explaining it makes it seem like it's intuitive knowledge. Um, the one case where Locke says we do have intuitive knowledge of existence is when it's knowledge of our own existence. And he doesn't explain how that works. Um, it, you know, it, it has to have something to do, the reason it's intuitive in that case and not in the other case, has to have something to do with the difference between sensation and reflection. Um, I have more things to say about that, but I'm not going to say them because there's only five minutes left and I wanted to say something about Locke's proof of the existence of God. Um, so first of all, the existence of God, the proof, the knowledge of the existence of God is supposed to be demonstrative. That is, we need a proof of it. And um, how is the proof going to work? Well, you know, so we have God. And we have existence. So, like, one thing I haven't, I, I didn't point out is that if this is not a simple idea, and maybe that's the whole point of when he's saying that sensible knowledge is not as certain. Then maybe you should say it isn't certain at all. I don't know. But if this is not a simple idea, then right, if it's a complex idea, then we don't know if its parts ever existed together. Right? Like we could we we conceivably remembering each one from a different time. How do we know what time a memory is from? So that's a good question if you're in 106 to keep in, in mind when we read the second analogy, um, but which is for tomorrow actually. But um, but anyway, so so I mean that explains why like we're in what sense we can be unsure whether God exists or ever existed, because God is according to Locke is a complex idea. The idea of God. That's probably not true according to Descartes, right? According to Descartes, the idea of God is the idea of the infinite. But according to Locke, the idea of God is a complex idea. So, right. So, so we have to put something else in between here. And um Locke says what we put in between here is our own existence. Because this is intuitive. And now all we have to do is fill in this part. If I exist, then God must exist.
Um, so this is basically exactly the same setup as Descartes in the third meditation. Um, and Locke even alludes to Descartes' argument about doubt when he talks about the intuitive knowledge of our own existence. That, that That's a piece I don't know quite how to fit in. But in any case, he's he is kind of following Descartes here, I think. Ray, that is that I know that I at least exist. And then based on that, I'm going to be able to show that certainly um, I didn't cause myself to exist, but rather God caused me to exist, something like that. Um, So I think I'm not going to go into the details of the proof. I don't think I have time left to do that. Um, it's it's kind of a version of what Kant calls the cosmological proof. Um, uh, but the cosmological proof, the way Kant understands it, starts with the contingency of the world, where in this case, I, I'm the world, right? I'm the only world I know intuitively exists, apparently. So again, it's the setup of Descartes' third meditation. The meditator has proved that they exist, and now they need to prove that something else exists, namely God. Um, so they take themselves as the world, and they try to prove that the world must have a cause that's uh, better than the world. <laughs> right. So, um, so uh, like in... Uh, in in this case, the imperfection in the world is not that it's contingent, that it might not have existed, at least not directly. The imperfection in it is just that it had a beginning. So, um, and whatever has a beginning must be preceded by something else. Because, and this is supposed to be intuitively certain, nothing can ever produce something. No, nothing can, sorry, nothing can never produce something. Locke doesn't explain exactly why that's so certain. Descartes also appeals to that at this point. I'm not sure if they mean exactly the same thing by it, or if they have exactly the same reason for thinking it's true. Um... And so, you know, from there, the, the, the proof is basically that something must have always existed, um, but that thing must have uh, had uh, more power than any of the things that later existed because it had enough power to produce all of them. Um, and it must have had all perfections or some higher version, right? As Locke, as Descartes would say, the eminent reality um, of the perfections that were in the things it created. Um, and from that we get, I'm just going to sum up the conclusion quickly here since I'm out of time. The, the conclusion is, this is book four, chapter 10, section six, page 549. There is an eternal, most powerful, and no, most knowing being. So we don't get necessity of existence, and we don't get infinity other than past eternity. Um, we don't actually need to show, we, I mean, I think the proof doesn't actually show literal omnipotence or omniscience. Um, in a sense, Locke thinks we can't show those things, right? That's like knowing the space as an infinite whole. We don't have an idea of an infinite whole. But we have as an idea of infinite as better, bigger than any finite amount I supply. So like what we get out of this is a proof that um, God is more powerful than anything you compare him to. More knowing than anything you compare him to. And that's 
at least most of what Locke needs for the main reason he needs to prove God exists, namely for the foundation of morality as he understands it. Right? All he has to prove is that God is powerful and knowing enough to match any other rewards and punishments and exceed them both in accuracy and in intensity. Right? So the the what is proved is like fit to the use he wants to make of it. Um I'll also say that the good that the God that Locke proves exists is, I think, actually a lot closer to the God that Kant proves exists than um than it, or like Spinoza or Leibniz. Because Kant also base in the end wants God as the as as a basis of morality. Um okay, that's all I have time for. I will see you tomorrow on zoom <laughs> um and so until then stay safe <laughs> bye